And uh, in general, in our experiment, we were interested in um, how participants or humans in general choose between um, multiple information sources to guide their decisions. And we refer to these uh, information sources as predictors because they make predictions about a certain kind of state, such as um, the traffic situation. And um, so to make a choice between both of these predictors, I have to consider the information they provide. So for example, I know that um, information about the traffic is updated every other minute on this traffic app, um, while information on this local radio program might already be outdated. So this kind of decision is often referred to as um, exploration or exploitation, because for example, if I um, choose to uh, select um, this traffic app, I know that the information uh, provided by the app will be probably uh, very accurate in predicting the traffic, uh, traffic situation. And uh, in such a case, I make an exploitative choice, which is um, driven by my uh, belief in how accurate this predictor is. And on the other side, I could also make an explorative choice. And an explorative choice is often defined by choosing something where you are uncertain about how accurate um, uh, the predictor will give you information uh, on this certain kind of state, let's say. And um, whether you make an explorative or an exploitative decision, it's not for um there we go hang on something weird there you go yeah uh, so whether you make an explorative or an exploitative decision is often um um uh, uh impacted by the time you have so by uh, the number of times you're presented with the same predictors because it only makes sense to explore uncertain predictors if you also have a lot of time to make use of your gained knowledge um during later encounters so um we were interested in <laughs> so we were interested in um, how accuracy and uncertainty drive choices across time and also how these concepts of accuracy and uncertainty are represented um, when in the brain when participants are in phases of exploration and exploitation. So um, to do this, we had to create um, a task during which participants um, choose between multiple predictors uh, to get information on a certain state. So uh, we created this task um, where uh, participants had the goal to find um, the location of a target, which is here represented as a star, on the circle. And importantly, uh, the participant could not learn about the target location um, themselves, but instead they made a binary choice between these predictors here in green and in blue to get information on where to find the target. So for example, if you choose um, one predictor, uh, you could observe how well they are in predicting this target location by the distance between the true target location, again, here the star, and the predictor's estimate, which is represented as a dot on the circle. And uh, this distance between the true location and the predictor's estimate, we also refer to as um, angular error. So it could also be that if you choose, um, for example, this blue predictor, uh, you, would, um, you would observe a predictor which actually has a much bigger angular error, and again, um, which is defined by this distance uh, between target location and predictor's estimate. Okay, so, um, so first you make this choice between predictors in this decision phase, and then you enter, um, enter into the second phase of the trial, which we also refer to confidence, um, confidence stage. And here we ask participants to make a confidence judgment in basically how confident they are that this predictor will perform um, accurately in predicting the target location. So what they would be presented with is um, the circle. Um, and I think you also see my mouse, right? Um, so the circle, and they would see in the middle uh, the selected predictor. Here, in this case, um, A was selected. And then on the circle outline, they would see the predictor's estimate. And then um, two stripes would appear like this, which represents um, an interval. And this interval could be modified in size um, depending on how confident the participant is uh, in the predictor's performance. So let's imagine it's the first time you choose this kind of predictor and you are rather uncertain in how accurate this predictor is, then it would be better to open up this interval. And on the other side, if you've chosen multiple times from the same predictor and you um, have observed that this predictor is quite good, then you should uh, choose to narrow down this interval. And then you would get into uh, the, uh, the outcome phase where you would uh, see the true target location here represented as yellow star and also possible uh, points you gained on that trial. 
And whether you gain trials on, uh, gain, <laughs> gain points or not in a given trial would depend on whether the target would fall inside or outside the circle. So here, for example, it fell inside the circle, so you actually gain points. And the uh, magnitude of points is dependent on the size of your interval. So the bigger um, the size, the less points uh, you will receive. And then on the other side, if the target falls outside the interval, you will receive a zero payoff. So you can really see that we try to set up a payoff scheme um, which would incentivize participants to choose uh, predictors um, of which they think are accurate and also of which they are certain that they are accurate. Because this kind of combination of beliefs would then allow participants to um, narrow down the content interval and maximize points across uh, the task. And because there's quite a lot of information, maybe we should just um, go through an example trial. So I'm just going to show you exactly what the participant would see in a given trial. So uh, here again, we are in the decision phase and participants can choose between both predictors. And in this case, they uh, chose the green predictor. Then uh, they get into the confidence phase. They see again the selected predictor in the middle and the predictor's estimate actually now with a uh, black dot. And um, they also see this interval, which is um, which we set randomly at each trial. And then uh, let's imagine again, we have never chosen the screen predictor before. What you should do is you should actually open up this interval. And once you lock your choice, you can see the true target location so you can learn about um, how well the predictor performed by um, observing this angular error. So again, the distance between target and predictor's estimate. And you can also see the points you gained, which are 0 0.5, which uh, equal basically to 50% of the circle. So basically, um, are determined by a confidence interval. Mm. And then you would uh, get into the second trial and you would either be presented with different predictors or with similar predictors and so forth. Okay, I hope that's clear. Um, so in our experiment, we were interested in how participants form beliefs and how well each predictor um, estimates the target location. Or if we say this a bit more specifically, um, how well um, how participants form beliefs about the angular error associated with each predictor. And to do this, we used um, a Bayesian model. And the principle underlying a Bayesian model is that um, participants would enter a trial and they would have a prior belief. So this just means an expectation of how well each predictor would perform in this given trial if selected. And then once they select a predictor, they make an observation, which is defined by this angular error. And once having observed this, they can update their prior belief resulting in posterior belief. And then again, this posterior belief serves as um, prior belief on the uh, next encounter with the same predictor. And again, because that's a bit abstract, maybe let's have a look at how belief distributions actually change across time uh, when you um, select multiple times from the same predictor. And in the upper panel, I show you how this belief distribution would change um, if you select from a good predictor and then in the lower panel, how it would change if you select from a worse predictor. And you can see on the x-axis, you have um, the angular error, which again represents um, the, basically the quality of performance. And um, a higher number means a worse angular error, so they're performing worse. And on the y-axis, you have the belief strength with a higher number, reflecting that the participant thinks that this angular error is more likely to underlie the true distribution, true distribution of the selected predictor. Okay, so uh, for example, choosing the first time or one of the first times from the predictors, you can see that the distribution is quite shallow, uh, covers lots of angular errors with um, similar belief strength. So it means that participants have not yet made up their mind of which, uh, which angular error might, uh, might underlie the true distribution. And then across time or selections, uh, you can see that the belief distribution changes um, with um, in two kind of features. So the first one is that you can see it becomes much more peaky across time. So this means uh, participants start forming um, a more narrowed down belief about which angular error might underlie the distribution. And the second feature um, is the width of the distribution and that it gets smaller um, with the number of selections. So this means they're getting a bit more um, certain in which kind of angular error really underlies this distribution. Uh, and these are exactly the two belief estimates um, we used on, on a given trial to also 
trying to understand choice behavior and further also neural data. So what we've done is that uh, on each trial, we, um, we extracted two belief estimates. And the first one was um, the accuracy estimate, which means um, the participants believe in how accurate they think the predictor is in estimating the target. And uh, this accuracy estimate is defined by the mode of, um, of the belief distribution at each trial for each predictor. And then the second estimate is, um, is a range across this accuracy estimate here in blue, uncertainty, which basically means um, how uncertain they are that this is really the true underlying accuracy estimate. So again, like accuracy and uncertainty are now here the key, key variables we, um, we are using to explain choice behavior in neural data. So actually, if you have some questions now, good point to ask, because otherwise it might get a bit tricky later on. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Cool. All right. So then we were wondering um, uh, how participants make um, selections between predictors um, according to their beliefs of accuracy and uncertainty. And for this, we're looking uh, at the decision phase and basically when they're choosing between predictors. Um, but before I show you the results, I just want to throw in some information about the design. Um, so first of all, uh, participants actually, in fact, they transition through uh, multiple blocks with different lengths, which also define um, so-called time horizons. And participants um, would transition um, or would sometimes find themselves in a long time horizon, which would be defined by, for example, 45 trials, and sometimes in uh, smaller time horizons, which could be 15 trials. And in each time horizon or in each block in general, participants encounter uh, four uh, predictors. So two, um, two of these four predictors would be good predictors. So on average, they will have a small angular error and two, the other two predictors would be bad predictors. So on average, they would have a bigger angular error. And uh, in each block, they would be presented a new a set of predictors. So they really have to continuously learn about um, which predictor is uh, good in um, estimating the target location. And uh, so the reason why we uh, integrated these time horizons is because we were interested in um, the modulation of accuracy and, un and uncertainty on choice behavior across time. So because um, we were expecting that um, participants should be more accuracy seeking, for example, uh, towards the end of the block, while in the beginning there should be more um, uncertainty seeking. Because um, if you're more explorative in the beginning, then maybe you might find a better option, um, which will allow you towards the end to um, actually make even more points in this task. So one analysis on behavior, what we will look at in a second, is um, how accuracy and uncertainty changes just continuously through the block, basically. And uh, the other, um, other time aspect we were interested in is um, how the impact of accuracy and uncertainty um, is modulated as a function of time horizon. Because uh, as I said beforehand, it only makes sense to, um, to be uncertainty driven and to uh, be explorative if you also have lots of time uh, later on uh, to make use of your gained knowledge. So if you know that you are actually presented with the same set of predictors. And uh, participants also had um, access to this time information. In fact, they um, had this um, black bar, which is kind of like a time bar underneath um, both predictors during the decision phase. And uh, this time bar would give them two kinds of information. So uh, first would be um, it decreases by one after every completed trial. So they would exactly know where they are in the block and also when the block is finished. And um, the second information is when uh, on the first trial in the block, they would exactly know whether they're on a long, medium, or short horizon. So they really have uh, information about time, which they can then um, integrate into their decision making. OK, so let's have a look at the first behavioral analysis, where we looked at um, uh, the impact of accuracy and uncertainty across time. And to do this, um, we, we split trials into a first and second block half. And we calculated um, a regressor as the difference between the left and the right predictor in their respective accuracy and uncertainty estimates. And we use these, um, these regressors to predict left bots choice. So this means if you have, for example, a positive accuracy um, effect, that uh, this means that participants are accuracy seeking. 
So now when we look at the data, we can see here in red that um, in general, there's positive effect across time for accuracy. So participants are accuracy seeking in the beginning, but more stronger um, towards the end of the block. And while we see a bit of a different effect uh, for uncertainty, we see that in fact, um, the polarity of uncertainty changes across time and that participants are more uncertainty seeking. So this positive effect um, at the beginning of the block, while towards the end of the block, we can see this negative uncertainty effect, which can be either uh, interpreted as uncertainty avoiding or as the inverse as certainty seeking. And this kind of, um, uh, kind of change in effect we also refer to as uncertainty polarity change, um, which is yeah, quite handy to keep in mind for the rest of the presentation, really. And uh, yeah, so, so it, basically in this first analysis, we've seen that um, uh, participants make predictor selections according to their beliefs of accuracy and uncertainty. And um, these kind of accuracy and uncertainty beliefs, they impact choice behavior differently depending on where you are at in the, within a block. And you can also see that towards the end of a block, participants are more accuracy seeking and uncertainty avoiding, which is quite in line with um, their general tendency um, or their general behavior they should exert in the task to maximize points. Because again, if you choose um, an accurate predictor you are certain about, you can um, decrease this confidence interval in the second phase of the trial, which again uh, will probably help you to maximize points in the task. All right. So then this, <clears throat> the second analysis, we looked at um, accuracy and uncertainty impact on choice behavior as a function of time horizon. And one way to do this is uh, to take um, a multiple of each time horizon and to repeat um, a similar analysis as we've just looked at. So basically, we took the first 15 triads, which are common to each time horizon, and we um, used, again, accuracy and uncertainty uh, to pred predict the left bot's choice. And as I said earlier, what we would expect is that participants are more uncertainty seeking in longer horizons. So here on the left at 45, uh, compared to shorter horizons here at 15. And they're more accuracy seeking in shorter compared to longer horizons because it's best to go for your best guess because again, that helps you to maximize points. So then looking at the data, this is exactly the kind of interaction effect um, we, we were hoping for. So you can see again that accuracy has a positive effect and it uh, increases in uh, strength um, in a, a shorter time horizon. But again, we can see a similar uncertainty polarity change when we go from long horizon to short horizon here in blue again. So you can see that participants are more uncertainty seeking uh, in longer horizons uh, compared to shorter horizons. Um, so yeah, these are basically the behavioral results, which I think is quite cool because we can see that participants use um, information about their beliefs um, to make predictor selections and they uh, use this kind of beliefs um, differently depending on whether they are uh, in earlier or later phases in the block and also depending on how many times they still can choose from the same uh, predictor set. Okay. So then we went on and uh, we wanted to know how uncertainty and accuracy is uh, presented in the brain. And um, to do this, we, um, we relied on a similar cal uh, variable calculation as previous studies. So um, we actually calculated a prediction difference term, which is the difference between the chosen and the unchosen predictor, again, in its respective accuracy and uncertainty estimate. And um, this uh, kind of difference is also very similar to previous studies which looked at um, value difference, um, where value difference is also calculated as this, a difference between chosen and unchosen. And uh, in one of these previous studies, for example, when you calculate a value difference term and you correlate it with signal in the brain, often what we find is activation in this like medial wall of uh, rent medial prefrontal cortex or VMPFC uh, and medial orbital frontal cortex. And then um, an interesting bit is that um, we don't only really see this activation as um, being correlated with the prediction difference or value difference term, but what we can do is we can, um, uh, we can use the signal and then uh, dissociate, and, uh, dissociate it in its both components of chosen and unchosen and see whether activation actually also correlates with each of these components. So basically, whether it's not only just a prediction difference term, but also chosen and unchosen are represented. 
And um, in this particular study, if they, they've done this, and what we can see is that BMPFC, in fact, uh, not only correlates with a difference term, but instead also represents both sides of this difference term with a positive chosen value and a negative unchosen value. So we were wondering whether um, we could see something similar for our accuracy and uncertainty effect, um, given that it, both of these belief estimates should be variables that drive decisions, that guide decisions, similar to the um, value comparison um, in this kind of previous study. Okay, so uh, first of all, we were um, wondering how accuracy and uncertainty presented across all trials, so really independent of any kind of time aspect. So we calculated this prediction difference and we correlated it with a signal in the brain. And what we can see is that, um, uh, that we actually find the neural representation of uncertainty and accuracy. And in fact, we find it both represented in VMPFC. So VMPFC does not only represent um, a single decision variable, but instead like two complementary beliefs. So on the one hand in orange, you can see um, a positive accuracy prediction difference so it represents of um, beliefs about how accurate uh, participants think the predictors are. And on the other side, it also represents information about their uncertainty. Um, so basically, um, yeah, their uncertainty and how accurate they are. And note here that this is actually a negative uncertainty term, um, which is again, very much in line with, um, with the effect we saw on behavior um, during later phases in the block, but also uh, during shorter time horizons because this combination of negative uncertainty and positive accuracy effect really, again, helps participants um, um, to make basically um, to maximize points across the task, basically, by choosing, again, an accurate and uncertain predictor. So um, what we've also seen on behavior level is that um, this uncertainty effect did not um, only had a positive effect or a negative effect, but instead we had this kind of polarity change across time, um, with first being more uncertainty driven um, to then later being more uh, uncertainty avoiding. So we were wondering whether um, we could see like a similar modulation of uh, uncertainty if we, um, if we separate trials into phases of exploration and exploitation. Because if the MPFC really represents the relevant decision variable, then we would expect that uh, during exploration, we would find a positive uncertainty prediction difference term. <laughs> and then uh, during exploitation, we would find, again, this uh, negative uncertainty prediction difference. So this is uh, what we've tested. So we classify trials according to exploration and exploitation. And I can tell you later on if you're interested how we did that exactly. And uh, first of all, we looked at um, um, and um, exploitation and what we found is, um, again, we found activation, um, uncertainty representation in the MPFC and perhaps a bit more dorsal. And again, this uncertainty representation was presented uh, with a negative polarity. And what we can do now, similar to uh, previous studies, we can like, again separate this prediction difference into its ter two terms of chosen and unchosen. And we can really uh, test whether the MPFC Mm, represents both of these sides, uh, sides of a, a decision signal. So uh, we extract an unbiased region of interest um, based on VMPFC, and we correlate um, chosen uncertainty and unchosen uncertainty um, with the board signal across time. And what we find then is that in, indeed, VMPFC represents both of these sides. Um, in fact, it represents actually a negative chosen uncertainty term and a positive um, unchosen uncertainty term, which makes up this overall negative uncertainty prediction difference, which we just uh, saw on whole brain level. Um, and then we can, when we compare this, um, this kind of same analysis uh, to, uh, to explorative phases, what we can see is exactly the opposite polarity of, um, of the same variable in the same uh, brain area. So now we can see that um, instead, um, uncertainty just generally is uh, uncertainty prediction difference is uh, represented positively um, with a more positive chosen component compared to the unchosen component. So 
So it really uh, shows that uh, VMPFC um, represents uncertainty, but um, according to um, the behavior mode of exploration or exploitation, with first being um, having representing a positive uncertainty prediction difference in exploration and a negative one in exploitation. So uh, then we were wondering um, whether uh, we do not only see polarity changes in the representation of uncertainty when we compare exploration and exploitation, but instead, can we also see um, network differences between behavioral modes? Um, so here on the right, uh, you've seen already um, this kind of activation. We see VMPFC uh, being, uh, or this kind of like activation pattern a bit more focal on VMPFC and, um, and a bit more dorsally. But now actually during exploration, we can see that there's a much wider network uh, uh, representing uncertainty signal covering brainstem and also subcortical areas and also um, areas that have been in, um, involved during foraging behavior, uh, for example, such as uh, dorsal anterior single leg cortex. And uh, then that's also uh, very continued and we wondered whether, you know, there are lots of studies of, uh, about uncertainty during exploration and most of the time um, uh, they were talking about um, uh, the ACC or frontal pole or dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, so these kind of like three key areas. So we wondered whether we can actually replicate um, activation um, in these areas when we're looking when we are looking at the uncertainty effect during exploration. And uh, this is indeed what we found. So we have here you can see it much more again by the network representing uncertainty with the ACC frontal pole dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, and now the interesting bit is um, to test whether um, these areas uh, have a similar profile compared to VMPFC or a different one. So do they represent uncertainty just during exploration or is it something they also represent uh, during exploitation um, similar to VMPFC? So we took these, uh, we took, uh, we extracted uh, activation from independent region of interest from each of these areas. And we looked at the uncertainty representation during exploitation. And then we actually did not find any significant um, activation during um, in either of these three areas uh, for uncertainty. So it seems like VMPFC is kind of uh, plays a special role in representing uncertainty. Um, so the relevant decision variable um, according to the behavior mode. While these areas are more involved during exploration. Um, yes. Okay. So so far we've seen. Um, Participants are uncertainty driven in the beginning, um, and then in these kind of uh, moments, um, <laughs> um, uncertainty is represented in VMPC and a more wider network, while towards the end, participants are more uh, certainty seeking, um, while we also see uh, a negative uncertainty prediction difference in VMPFC. And then uh, we were wondering a bit more about um, this kind of certainty effect and how we can understand it. And uh, one way maybe to interpret the certainty effect is as a default choice. So um, an effective default choice in this experiment would be um, to repeat a predictor you have also previously um, chosen. And in particular, if you think that this um, predictor is accurate and you are certain that this predictor is accurate. So we went on and tried to develop a bit of a different perspective to see whether we can understand the certainty effect a bit better. And uh, we, um, we, um, we've done, um, we performed kind of like a repetition analysis where uh, we looked at, um, where we separated trials either into repetition. So this means you are choosing the same predictor as on the previous trial. And in non-repetition trials where you are choosing a different predictor at the current trial compared to the previous trial. And then we first of all wanted to know whether um, there's like a higher percentage of repetition trials in uh, exploitation compared to exploration. So that's what we're plotting here on the right with a higher number meaning um, occurs more often. And then we can see that um, indeed participants are actually repeating the previous predictors more often during exploitation compared to exploration. And uh, then we went on and we wondered whether this kind of um, similar but still a bit different perspective would also then uh, be represented as um, in the brain or particularly in VMPFC. So we looked at whether, um, whether you could find activity that co-varies with uh, repetition as a main effect and also uh, as an interaction with um, the uncertainty that is associated with the selected predictor. 
So uh, again, we've done a similar time course analysis and what we can see is that activity in uh, activation in VMPFC uh, positively co-varies with repetition. So the signal um, increases when you repeat a, um, a predictive you've also previously chosen. And then this uh, kind of main effect also interacts with um, the uncertainty you associate with the predictor. And because interaction terms are sometimes difficult to understand, uh, what we've done is that we split trials into repetition and no repetition, and we looked at the uncertainty prediction difference in VMPFC. And then, in fact, what we can see is a similar, actually, yeah, a similar polarity change in the representation of uncertainty. So you have a positive uncertainty rep representation when uh, participants are not repeating. So basically, they're switching around um, compared to a negative uncertainty prediction difference um, when they are repeating uh, uh, predictors as on the previous, previous trial. Okay, so, uh, so next, um, so okay, let's, let's have a quick recap. So we know now that uh, participants are uncertainty seeking in the beginning. This means they are not repeating the same predictors before, so they're switching around, they're shuffling around between predictors. Then um, during later phases, during exploitative phases, participants are uh, choosing um, predictors they are certain about that they are accurate, so they keep um, they engage in, in a kind of repetitive behavior. But before actually being able to um, engage in this repetitive behavior, participants should have learned uh, which predictor is accurate. So there should be kind of a, a transition phase between exploration and exploitation um, during which participants learn about how accurate each predictor is, which then again allows them to, um, to repeatedly choose that kind of predictor during exploitation. So uh, we define this uh, new subset of trials according um, to accuracy prediction difference. And again, I can tell you later a bit more about how we've done this. But um, the important bit is that we hypothesized also that these uh, transition trials would occur in time between exploration and exploitation. So they would occur after exploration, but before exploitation. And that's what I'm plotting here on the right side. So you have um, the timing of these trials within a block with a higher number, which is basically meaning uh, very counterintuitively uh, that they occur earlier. And a smaller number means uh, they're occurring later. And then in fact, we see um, that the transition trials really are occurring in between both exploration and exploitation. So um, then we wondered, uh, that, that was the question really, um, if, um, if BMPFC represents the relevant decision variable also during such a transition, um, and during this transition, um, it's important to keep track of the accuracy between predictors, then perhaps we can see such kind of representation of accuracy prediction difference in BMPFC. So again, uh, you, you know the deal, did the same analysis again, like a similar approach, um, where we looked at accuracy prediction difference uh, in a region of interest approach. And then we also saw uh, that the signal co-varied with um, accuracy prediction difference. And now you can do this interesting bit where you look at uh, whether this accuracy prediction difference is unique to the transitions, uh, transition phase, or whether it in fact also occurs during uh, earlier explorative trials or later exploitative trials. So we've done this, we looked at explorative trials, repeated the um, same analysis, just on a different subset of trials. And uh, what we can see is again, this here um, positive blue prediction difference, which relates to the uncertainty. So we've seen that before, but um, the interesting bit here is that we have a lack of accuracy prediction difference. And then analog, we can look at the same analysis during exploitation. And then again, we find this negative uncertainty prediction difference, but again, a lack of uh, accuracy prediction difference. So it really seems that um, accuracy prediction difference or the accuracy between predictors, so how well participants think uh, each predictor is or performs, um, is represented during this kind of transition phase. Okay, so uh, now I've shown you that um, participants are uncertainty seeking in the beginning of a trial or more specifically, um, or beginning, of, beginning of a block or more specifically um, in a longer time horizon. So when you have many opportunities to still make use of your knowledge, 
And in these kind of um, cases, when you are um, uncertainty-driven and explorative, um, you also have such kind of uh, representation of uncertainty um, in BMPFC and in the wider network covering DHC, front pole, and so forth. Then we've also shown that uh, BMPFC also represents a second uh, complementary belief, um, the, how the accuracy about predictors and this accuracy prediction difference uh, was particularly prominent uh, during this kind of transition phase. And then finally, once participants um, figured out which kind of predictor is accurate, they kind of engaged in a, in a repetitive behavior um, where the certainty between predictors was the relevant decision variable and as such also represented in BMPFC. So I hope I've shown you that uh, with BMPFC represents multiple decision variables and the strength and polarity of which can vary depending on uh, behavior, behavior context of exploration and exploitation. Okay, so uh, this was um, the first part and I can talk a bit more about social stuff and don't worry, it's not gonna be that long. Um, okay, so now we've uh, looked at how participants uh, choose between uh, non-social predictors such as you know, radio program and traffic app to inform the decisions. But actually, in fact, often we get information, sorry, uh, often we get information from uh, social predictors or we can also call them um, advisors. For example, uh, yeah, um, all this information we just recently got and how to behave in pandemic. Um, and often when we get these kind of information from uh, social advisors, we have to ask ourselves if, uh, how confident are we actually in the information provided. So this is um, the second bit of the talk now, very small talk, a uh, very sec a small bit. <laughs> and um, uh, we actually looked at uh, how participants form confidence judgments about social compared to non-social predictors and whether there would be uh, anything unique when you form your confidence judgments about information you get from a social predictor. So we use the same task as before, um, but in fact now, uh, like the same structure, let's say, but um, now participants, the same participants uh, performed a social and a non-social condition. So we use the uh, within subject design. And uh, the difference between the conditions was really just uh, the framing or the instructions we gave participants in that in the social condition, we instructed participants that they would choose between um, different kinds of advisors. And these advisors, they represent previous participants that actually had the chance to learn about uh, the um, true distribution of the target, which again here is actually represented as a flower, we called it. And uh, the goal was uh, to, again, um, select the advisor that um, predicts the flower the best, such that you can decrease your confidence interval and maximize the points. And uh, in comparison, in the non-social condition, participants were selecting between different kinds of fruits and they would fall uh, with different distances, distances from their tree, which is represented as this black dot. And, you know, some would fall with a smaller distance, some would fall with a larger distance, and your goal is um, to select a, a fruit that actually falls from um, the, their tree with a smaller distance again, because it allows you to narrow down this interval and then again, maximize your points across the task. So we were interested in um, this kind of um, phase within a trial. So where participants set their confidence across, um, uh, 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 yeah, just set their confidence basically in how confident that they are that this kind of social or non-social predictor will perform um, well in the trial. So what we've done is uh, that we just looked at quite easy measures. So we first of all looked at the uh, confidence judgment, which again, remember, is the interval on a given trial. So this means um, here uh, in, the, in, the, in the plot um, that a higher number means a, higher, uh, a bigger interval, which represents a lower confidence. And a smaller number uh, is a smaller interval, which means higher confidence. Um, and we can see that actually um, participants on average um, set a smaller interval uh, for social compared to non-social um, predictors. And then we were wondering um, whether this kind of difference uh, would also be due to the fact that participants just learn better about social and non-social predictors, um, so which kind of predictor is better at performing in the task. So we looked at this um, second measure where we compared um, the, the yellow and the red arrow. 
So the yellow error represents the distance between the predictor's estimate, again the dot, and the confidence interval, uh, while the uh, red arrow represents the angular error, so it's the, the, the true performance, which is the distance between uh, the target and the predictor's estimate. So uh, when you take the absolute difference between both um, errors, you can tell um, how well participants match their confidence interval um, to the true performance. So basically, um, a higher, a bigger distance means that the uh, confidence interval is further away or is um, further away from the target. So they were quite bad at ma matching their confidence according to the uh, true performance, while uh, a smaller distance means that they are better at matching their confidence with the true performance. And then here we can see that um, actually participants were better in matching their confidence uh, for social compared to non-social predictors. Okay, so uh, we've seen participants are a bit more uh, confident when judging their um, confidence uh, about social predictors compared to non-social predictors. And um, they also were better at uh, uh, matching their confidence according to the true, um, true performance of the uh, selected predictor. So in the final analysis, we uh, wanted to know about um, how this confidence um, judgment, again, this is just really the interval across all trials, uh, is represented in the brain and whether we can see any differences in how it is represented when we compare social and non-social uh, conditions. So uh, we correlated this confidence interval uh, um, with activity um, uh, across uh, in, the, in the brain. <laughs> and uh, what, we can uh, what we found is that uh, for the social condition, we find this uh, cluster um, on posterior temporal parietal junction, so TPJ, um, that actually co-varied with participants' uh, confidence judgments about social predictors. And then we compared conditions by taking this, um, this yellow uh, unbiased um, mask, and we, um, when comparing conditions in this kind of um, a mask, we can see this kind of uh, this green small cluster that is significantly different between conditions. So that's what they are uh, maximi maximally different between conditions when representing their confidence judgment. Um, and so this confidence uh, phase um, is quite an unusual uh, thing because uh, so what we've done is that we first we lock the signal to the onset of the confidence phase, but in fact, actually participants make multiple button presses to actually get um, to the idea or to the, um, to the interval they actually want to select. So what we can also do is we can lock uh, the signal to a closer time and to their, um, to their response. So basically really their response time. And what we can see then again, if we use a similar uh, time course analysis and we um, regress the confidence judgment across activity in this uh, uh, in uh, TPJ, we can see again this difference between um, social and non-social, so that um, confidence is stronger represented in TPJ in this, uh, social, this brain area that we know is associated with social cognition um, for also um, uh, the social condition here. Okay, so uh, today I've talked about predictive decision-making frontal cortex. Um, I I hope I've showed you that um, participants make predictive selections um, depending on their beliefs and the accuracy and uncertainty, but they use their um, beliefs um, differently depending on whether they are um, in early or later phases or whether they have more time or less time. And um, I hope I showed you that, um, um, that in particular VMPFC plays a unique role in representing these beliefs, uh, in particular uncertainty in that um, um, it, it also represents uncertainty uh, during exploration. It's not only the other areas like a DAC or frontal pole, um, but it does also uh, represent uncertainty negatively during exploitation. And when we uh, form confidence judgments about um, social predictors, there's something um, unique compared to non-social uh, predictors and such a difference is also represented uh, in their behavioral confidence judgments, but also uh, in the activation um, in TPJ. All right, so um, that's it. Thank you. And uh, so uh, we actually also written this blog entry. So if you just want to have a quick and dirty version of the paper, go and check this out. 
And otherwise, uh, I would like to thank my uh, uh, PhD supervisors, uh, Matthew Rushworth and Mark Wittmann, and also a super good team behind the paper project in general, uh, Jacqueline Scholl, Miriam Kleinflüge, Eza Froyon, and Lev Tantovich, and of course, the Rushworth Lab. That's it. <laughs>